if you were to suggest a way of learning or to teach me an approach to learning, mm. regular poker, whatever that means, the type of poker I would play with my friends who are like, let's play poker, right? How might you think of approaching that? Well, given that you are, I mean, you're pretty well-rounded in your personality and that you like both sort of human interactive things, mm -hmm. but you can also nerd out really hard. Yes. I don't think there's really a wrong way to teach you poker. Mm -hmm. Like if I was to teach my my mum or something like that, my mum is the most, sounds strange to say, but she's the least autistic person <laughs> <laughs> in that she is so able to intuit yep. social situations. Yep and unbelievably emotionally intelligent, but could not, she's like phobic of math. She's interested in sort of scientific concepts, but if you actually try and get into the technical weeds, she's just like, she, she cannot. It's like, she would be in arms with Molly right now. Just like, she's just, a, she just feels, she's a very feel-based yeah. person. If I was to teach her the game, you know, I would take her to the table with a group of fun people and, you know, we would slowly just like turn the cards over and, you know, talk through. I'll give her the hand rankings and we take it very steady in, in terms of like, this is, look how the way that they're acting. So mm -hmm. they seem quite confident, you know, take a more human approach to it. Mm -hmm. But I think with you, we would want to jump s sort of straight into the game theory to an extent. So let me apply some parameters mm -hmm. if I could, just to allow us to conjure an image. So let's just say... <laughs> <laughs> he's really going to want to take my money now, which he will probably. So let's say I had a game with Jason and uh -huh. you can pick the sort of minimally viable period of time over which you think I could learn to be competent enough Ooh. that I might have a chance. Is it four weeks? Is it 12 weeks? And this is also not knowing how, how good Jason is. I have no idea because I've always refused to play. <laughs> but, he's pretty good. Okay, great. So let's just say... You know, if luck is on my side, having some chance in hell. Well, here's the thing. So yeah. you have a chance in hell anyway. If you sat down and just because played... Because it's not just going to be Jason. It's going to be an entire table. Well, no, but even if you were playing one-on-one -on -one against Jason, if you guys sat down, assuming you know the basic rules of like which hand beats There's always what, a chance. Okay, but let's, you know, assume yeah. the, the very basics, you know what betting chips means and sure, whether you have sure. a straight on the river or not. Assuming that, you and I could sit down and yeah. play 10 hands... And it's basically 50-50. Who wins? Okay, let's say you can pick the period of time of training. Right? So right. A, a, a however long it is. And then Jason and I are going to play... A thousand hands, let's say. Exactly. Yeah, a thousand hands. You're already... Your chance of beating Jason over a thousand hands, probably with like just knowing the rules, is 45%. That's, that's right. how crazy... Like, that's that the thing. Like, maybe it's a bit less than that. Maybe it's... Sorry, Jason. Maybe it's... Let's say 37%, maybe 35%. Oh, I'm going to get a phone call after this. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, could we get it so that you are a favorite against him? Eight weeks of intensive. Okay. Yeah. If, if you sat and studied all the charts... Mm -hmm. Because that's what it is really these days. So poker is, no, now that we know the mechanics of the game, basically there's this thing called game theory optimal solutions to different scenarios, which is basically, you know, if you have jack nine suited on this type of board against a person in this position, you will want to check raise them 30% of the time and check call 70% of the time or something like that. Basically, there, there are like answers to what you should do in different scenarios with what frequencies. It's all about frequencies. And so... Now that we know this, and, and you can run simulators to give you the answers of all these fictitious scenarios, now it's changed the game into a basically who's willing to, you know, learn as many different scenarios as possible and, like, basically emulate them in their head when they go and play. Hmm. So it's a very different type of game. It's more like kind of almost studying chess moves. I was just going to say yeah. it sounds a lot like studying like uh, chess scenarios. And it wasn't like that even 10 years ago. It was very, very different. I mean, there was some, it was more about, you, you'd sort of do com combination calculations in your head and that kind of thing, but that was kind of the limit of it. And honestly, it's actually one of the reasons why I, in the end, didn't like the game as much anymore. I've been doing it for 12 years anyway, and I, I was just starting to get itchy feet naturally, but it required more and more time spent to at the top levels, at least. Just with these incremental gains. Exactly. Diminishing returns in terms of hourly, 
Because also what it means is uh, because it's like these game theory optimal solutions exist, it means that there's technically this perfect style of play that any one, of it, any one person can play. And the more, the more people study this style, the more people are close to it. And so that means there is a ceiling of how perfectly you can play. Like technically, if you and I are both two computers that are able to play this game theory optimal style, we're just breaking even against each other over infinity. Uh, over the short time, you know, if we play for an hour, whoever gets the best cards will therefore win. But over infinity, we will just break even. And so that meant that you would have to be putting more and more time in to win a, a sort of shrinking pot of money, essentially. Which is why I, I don't now recommend to people to go out and try and be professionals in poker. But I still absolutely recommend that people to go and learn the game because it is probably the best way to... It's, it's the best mini analogue for the type of complex decision making that you need to do in life that you could do. And we're going to come back to this because I do think with my very little exposure to poker and having watched some on TV and nonetheless having had my ass handed to me <laughs> when I tried it live, that particularly maybe an easy map is investing and poker because there's there are just so many variables that are similar, mm -hmm. which is why I think so many investors are drawn to it. And also, give a plug, All In Podcast, check it out. That's Jake Al's podcast with his buds. It is a fantastic, fantastic show. I do think it is one of the, the best newish podcasts that mm. I've put into my rotation. So don't take all my money, Jason. <laughs> Eight weeks. What does the density of practice look like? Is that two hours a day? Is it 10 hours a week? What does the distribution look like? To be confident that, you're, that you will have like a 60-40 edge on him, I would want to do like 40 hours a week at least. Okay. Oh, all yeah. Right. All right, 40 yeah. hours. How does that break down if we have... You said eight weeks, right? Yeah. So hypothetically, let's say week one. What does the schedule and curriculum look like? So in the first week, I think we would... I mean, I would sit and just run out lots of different hands. I think in-person is better than online. So you actually just get to play with the cards, feel what it's like. You get really familiar with the betting patterns and that kind of thing. And we would talk about the more sort of general things like... You know, why are we betting? What, what are we seeking to find here? Okay, we want to find information. We get into the idea of like ranges, kind of a strange word, but basically, you know, if we're playing a hand right now, I don't know anything about your cards. All I know is that you've got two cards out of the, you know, a thousand and whatever the number is, combination of two cards that you can have. So right now your range is 100%. And same back at you. And then as the hand progresses, mm -hmm. basically, I want to narrow down the perceived range that I think you could have, you know, narrow, gain information so I can narrow that down and put you on a hand. While meanwhile, giving away as little information about my own possible range. So keeping it as wide open to you. So it's about maximizing deceptiveness sure. while extracting information out of your opponent. Mm -hmm. So I'd teach you about concepts like that. And we would talk about ways that you can do that. And then I think we would go and actually play a little bit in person just so you get used to the, again, the kind so of dynamics. So we need to find a table somewhere. Yeah. I mean, probably invite friends over and we just have some, yeah. have some games. And it's so much fun anyway. Those are the best type of poker games. Bring in my card mechanic and take all their money. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then after that, I think we would start, I don't know at what stage, but you know, once you seem competent and, and are able to, you're able to do sort of basic math calculations in your head about like, okay, well, I have to call $100 into a pot of $400. I'm getting four to one. What does that mean? What, how many cards are there that I need to hit, et cetera? So these kind of pot odd calculations, that kind of stuff. Could you just take a second and explain what you mean by pot odd calculations? So pot odds are basically, you know, like in investing to an extent. If things go well, what do you win versus how much would you lose? And then how do you bet size accordingly? Right, size exactly. Or like, you know, let's say you're, you're trying to hit a flush and there are nine cards left in the deck that could help you, say, out of 36. So you have a 25% chance of hitting the card you need. And meanwhile, the pot is offering you five to one. Well, now it's actually a profitable thing, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're getting the pot is offering you more than the odds that you need to, to hit your card. Mm -hmm. So Matt and I haven't talked about this stuff in ages. It's really interesting seeing my brain's like, oh, <laughs> find the words. So those kind of rudimentary types of math calculations that you need to do. 
And then as you get more comfortable in that, then you would start doing more like combination calculations. So again, like as you're sort of narrowing down your opponent's range, there will be presumably some hands that they will have that are better than your hand, you know, so what we would call value hands that they would be playing, but they would also have some bluffs in there. So you need to try and think about what are the conceivable bluffs they would have given the sort of story that's been told, you know, like pre-flop they raised early. So that means they probably have stronger cards than, than uh, weaker cards. So you can narrow it down to like the top end of the cards, uh, you know, like aces, kings, ace, king, ace, three suited, that kind of stuff. But then on the flop, when an ace came out, they actually slowed down. So that maybe suggests that they don't have an ace. Maybe they have more like nines, tens, eights, you know, to a pocket pair like that. You know, weaving together bits of evidence to be able to narrow down people's ranges and put them on like conceivable bluffs versus conceivable strong hands. So that kind of stuff. After that, if, you know, you're seeming to grasp all that, then we would actually start looking at the, the solver charts. So these are these like simulators. There's this one called Pio Solver that was at least popular in the day when I was playing. How do you spell that? P-I-O. P-I-O. P-I-O Solver. I think it's still the main one. And at least when I was, you know, using it, that was back in 2016 or so, it would take many hours to run a sim. So, so you know, you'd be like, I want to know what the optimal play is with Jack-9 suited on a 10 8 4 rainbow board or something like that and then let it run folks listening i have no idea what i that know means either. It's okay. I, 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 don't no, I, just, I love, how, I love how it sounds though <laughs> yeah there's so much jargon in i poker. think i need a rainbow that's board. actually probably where we would start we would start with glossary because yeah, there's yeah. so many there's so many word terms the vocab, the, the vocab is, is is you know there's, there's just so much going on there but yeah so we would start running simulations so you can see and understand like okay this is this is what the optimal solutions would be in these certain situations because once you know what the optimal solutions are, then now you can, you're sort of equipped with this like really solid baseline of what the, the perfect play is, where if you don't have any information about your opponent that you can just follow and know that, you know, at worst you'll be breaking even, but you'll still be beating them. Mm -hmm. But then because you know what the perfect play is, you can look for ways to exploit their screw ups. Because in reality, everyone, even the pros are making mistakes. They aren't playing this perfect GTO style. But you can't really know the way that they're screwing up until you know what GTO is in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it acts as this like baseline benchmark of high quality play. So we would sit and we would study these charts. And if over that course of eight weeks, I got you so that you were able to like emulate these charts to, you know, I don't know how to quantify it, but to a, a good amount, mm -hmm. that would be more than sufficient to beat Jason. Um, because he's, you know, he's not a full-time pro. Yeah. He's good. Like he's played a lot. And We've only played once, and I was more just like bemused at the amount of words that were coming out of. Well, his mouth. I was going to say, if his poker is anything like his basketball, his ability to shit talk oh, is man. actually incredible. That guy I mean, is world class. He's very good at getting under your skin if he wants to get under your oh, skin. Oh yeah, oh yeah. 